going. All right, y'all turn to Romans 1. We're going to pick our study back up tonight right where we left off. We're just going to take our time as we go through this book. No hurry. We want to get all we can out of it. <clears throat> now, before we get started tonight, you know, I'm always telling y'all, you know, people we need to pray for, and y'all know all the regulars that we always have, you know, uh, Don and Yanny and Pam and Tim and Lee and, you know, Mr. Al and Chris here and Chris and Dean, just everybody y'all know. But tonight I want to ask y'all if you would, uh, as often as you can and you think of it, I'd ask y'all to pray for a group of people that, that they're at one of the nursing homes that I go to, and it's a big class, and there's a lady there that helps me so much, and Several of them have, have passed away. They got this virus thing real bad in there. And she mm. called me today. And I can't say the name of the home. I, they're not even supposed to give out information. But anyway, uh, several of the people that come to class are, are in real bad shape. And I'll just ask you, Bill Wood, to just keep them in your prayers. She said the worst thing is the is the fear, the look on their face when they tell them you've got it and they're moving them down to this. You know, mm. it would be terrifying for these old people. Oh, you know, so. yeah. Yeah, y'all, y'all just please keep them in your prayers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's go to um, go to the Lord in a prayer before we start. Father, we thank you for the chance to come together and to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity and the pleasure of calling you our Father. We know what it took to make this possible. We know you sent your Son into this world not only to die for us, but to be raised to bring us back to you. Father, we thank you for this unspeakable gift. We ask you to take your word tonight and build us up and strengthen us, purge us, purify us, make us all that you would have us to be. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to pick right back up, and let's go ahead each time as we're in these different sections. I want to read the section because repetition's good, okay? So let's read from Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you, unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now that's Paul's introduction here to this letter. And we're going to take our time going through it. But tonight what I want to do is we're just going to go right back to verse 1. Now Paul in his introduction says some things that we typically just blow by. And we don't want to do that. We want to get all we can out of this. Now he says Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Now last time we looked at how... Paul kind of takes this and it elevates. Okay? He says, I'm Paul. First and foremost, he says, I'm a servant. And we looked at what that meant. He meant, I'm a bond slave. Mm -hmm. But then he goes a step higher. He said, and more than a servant, because all saved people are servants, aren't they? Yep. He says, I'm an apostle. Now, can we make that claim? No. no. Folks, that ain't for us. No. He's showing us he's not only a servant, but he's a special servant. He's an apostle. But then the next thing he says is separated under the gospel of God. And it's my contention that he's still going higher. Now, it's not just that he's saying, I'm going to preach the gospel too. He's going to get into what this separated means. 
But in this introduction, what Paul's really doing is he's introducing himself to these Romans, and it's very important that he does this. Because remember, in his day, lots of people were uh, attacking him and saying he wasn't an apostle, were they? Mm -hmm. And there were also lots of false apostles. So you receive a letter from this man. Well, what's the first thing you do when you look at a letter? See who it's from. You see who it's from, don't yeah. you? You know, when I get one and it says, very important documents, do not throw away, I know right away, throw that. Yeah, I don't even need to look who it's from, right? right? That's how they put on there. But you know, you look at it, and if you see, in other words, if I see, uh, I'll tell you one I get once a month. AAA life insurance. If you get AAA for your car, you get their AAA life insurance every month. Month after, and every month I get it, and I don't even—I just see AAA, and immediately I know it goes to the garbage. I'm not interested in AAA's. That—that's that, for my car, right? Mm -hmm. But the point being is, what have I already decided about them? That you don't need. I don't need to hear what they have to say, okay. right? Well, what if these uh, Romans made that decision about Paul? And this letter wouldn't do what he wanted it to do, would it? Mm -hmm. So what's the first thing this man feels must be of utmost importance to mm -hmm. establish his credibility, mm -hmm. isn't it? He's got to do that. Now last week we talked about, we, we ended up talking about the marks of an apostle. We talked about a servant and the marks of an apostle. You remember according to Scripture, there are certain things that a man must have seen and done in order to claim himself to be an apostle. Number one, he had to be called by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He had to see the Lord resurrected in His resurrected body. He had to see Him. Number three, he had to perform the signs or the wonders of an apostle, didn't he? He also had to be taught by the Lord. And there was a whole list of things we went down that they had to do and, and had to be able to prove to, to say, I'm an apostle, right? Now, if a man can't prove those points about himself, he's not an apostle, is he? Mm -hmm. So we went through those and we looked at them. And Paul said, remember he said in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, he said that surely he had worked the signs of an apostle. In another place he said, have I not seen the risen Lord? He yeah. had. Yeah. He sure had. So he did all those things. So what I want to do is I just want to look at a couple things that I didn't get to last week before we move on. Now, Paul said he was a called apostle. Y'all go to Galatians 1. Now is that the same thing as far as like being a prophet? Is it, is it the same where you have to do certain things or see certain things? It, they're, they're on the same par. The signs weren't the same. and But there's a test for a prophet. But as far as men claiming to be apostles today, they're not. Men claiming to be prophets today, they're not. There's no need for them. And I'll show you all that in just a minute. Now he says in Galatians 1.1, watch how Paul says this. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. In other words... It wasn't men that decided to make him an apostle, and it wasn't men that put their hands on him and said, you are an apostle. For instance, Paul saying, no man, including Peter and the twelve, picked me like they did pick one, didn't they? Yeah. He said, I am an apostle directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So who made Paul an apostle? The Lord. the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's right. Now this is going to be very important tonight when we get into what we're talking about here. Because when Paul talks about being separated, he's going to say that God the Father, okay, not Christ now, God the Father separated Him from His mother's womb. Now that's kind of astounding, isn't it? Why would that really surprise us? It only surprises us when we think about it from our, from man's vantage point. Why would it surprise us if we just thought about God? Does God know everything He's going to yeah. do from before? So it, it shouldn't surprise us at all that He picked Paul before the foundation of the world. You know, we read about saved folks, every saved person. Did God know you before the foundation of the world? Oh, yeah. If we'll quit thinking about ourselves when it comes to election and whatnot and just think about God, it'll make perfect sense. Of course God knows before what He's, what he's going to do. But anyway... Paul says this. Now, Paul says he was a called apostle. Now, do y'all remember how the Lord called uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew? Come on. Yeah. Follow me. Follow me. me. I'll make you fishermen of men. I'll make you fishers of men. And what did they do? 
They dropped right. everything and went. Yeah. Folks, that ain't normal. Uh -uh. See, that's the supernatural power. That's the effectual call of the Lord. Those men were going to be apostles and the Lord said, come on. Matthew was sitting there as a, as a publican, tax collector, making good money, no doubt. And he, he threw a feast for the Lord that night, didn't he? Yep. And the Lord said, come on. And what did he do? He, he left it all and went, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's astounding when you think about it. But it ain't as astounding as this man, Paul. Uh-uh, no. Not even close, is no. it? How did the Lord call this man? He struck him down. He struck him down. Damascus. Now, on the road to Damascus, he knocks him to the ground, and what was he a second before? He was he was killing Christians. He was, he was Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, God's main enemy on the earth. That's right. Now y'all think about that, not from Paul's vantage point, but again, if we think about it from Paul's vantage point, we try and figure out what was special about Paul. Quit right there. Stop. That's not grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Leave Paul out of it and go up and look at it from God's perspective. Why did God pick Paul? Because he knew he was an expert in the law and stuff and knew how to, you know, it worked back then. He, he did not. That, you know, we would say he picked him because he knew the law. Because, but there's really something more than that. God had picked Paul before he was ever born and God made him an expert in the law. God? Why? Do you think it's a coincidence that Paul was trained like he was? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a coincidence that he was a Roman citizen? No. In other words, when had God, how long had God been preparing this man for this job? All his life. All his life. Now, that don't mean he was saved all his uh -huh. life. He wasn't converted. But when the fullness of the time came, what did God do? He struck him down. And here he comes. Yep. And it makes his call as an apostle all the more astounding. This man that was not with the twelve, nope. he didn't see the miracles, he was not just indifferent or uh, uh, you know, a Jew that was half-hearted, like you know, maybe Peter and him could have been, I don't know. This man was a violent opposer of the Lord. Yep. And in a split second, what did the Lord make him? The Lord made him an apostle. An apostle. Yeah. And not that, he's going to make him an apostle that says, I'm not the, not the least wit behind any of the chiefest apostles. You know, the, the, the argument some would make with this man was, oh, Johnny, come lately. No. You know, you know Peter and him spent all that time when now here's this Johnny come lately. And what does Paul say? There ain't no Johnny come lately. God picked me before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to kind of get into some of these things. But I want to read one more thing that Paul says about himself. They were scared of him. They were, they were scared of him for sure. But y'all go over to Galatians chapter 5, or Galatians, 1 Corinthians 15. You know, Paul was a blasphemer, mm -hmm. he was a murderer, and he was also called himself an apostle that was born out of due season. Right? Now, that born out of due season, is, it, there's something called, it, literally it's like the fallopian tube, baby, out of, out of place, not in the right area, but different than all the others, and he was. But in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, speaking of all the people that had seen the Lord, he goes to all the apostles that seen him, Verse 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Not all were apostles, but the disciples that were there that day saw him. And then in verse 7 he says, after that he was seen of James, then of the, all the apostles. Last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet or fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But... By the merit that is in me, I am what I am. Doesn't say it, does it? No. He it said, by the grace of God. Why was Paul an apostle? The grace of God. The grace of God. Yeah. Why was he not dead? The grace of God. It's only the grace of God. So he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So then what's Paul saying here? I'm an apostle by the grace of God and I have been the most active apostle by the grace of God. In other words, he said all that I am is because of God. Oh, that's right. okay, so that's the idea. Now, let's go back and consider again. We'll switch over to the new notes. What Paul's doing. Alright, Paul's introducing himself to the Romans. And it's crucial that he establishes his authority as an apostle. He's got to prove that he is commissioned by the Lord. 
Now, not only because of the doctrine he's going to teach, but because of the prevalence of all the false apostles. Now, let me show you what I mean. Go to Revelation 2. We just read this a couple months ago, but go to Revelation chapter 2. And watch what uh, John says, or the Lord actually says through John, to the church at Ephesus. By the way, one of the places Paul spent a lot of time. He says to the church in Ephesus, verse 2, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Now how do you try something? You test it. You know, the word try in other places is assay. Like you test gold, you assay it. So was there some means by which they could test an apostle? Yeah. Did you see the Lord risen? Not, in, not some dream you're claiming. Did you see Him risen? He ate with Peter and them, didn't He? Mm -hmm. Did He teach you the Gospel or did another man teach it to you? Do, can you do the signs of an apostle? You know, it's kind of like today a man says he's an apostle. And I say, okay, you can cast out devils. And most of them will say, yeah, I can do that. No problem. Then come here, I want to see you raise the dead. Yep, you know, exactly. you hear a lot of foolishness, but we don't see much raising the dead, do we? Yeah. You know, it's the same with the handling snakes. A man claims he's an apostle is going to handle snakes. It won't bite them. Yeah, they won't bite them. And half the time they milk them. Other times they, they cool them off. Where they, but the whole thing is, why bother with a snake? Let's get some arsenic and drink it. Because yeah. the verse says, handle snakes, drink poison. That's right. But you don't see much of that, do you? No. See, that's how you test an apostle by the signs. Mm -hmm. So, it's what the people in Ephesus would have done with a false apostle would be they'd ask him some questions. Were you there? Did the Lord teach you? Mm -hmm. were, you know, were you commissioned? Did He call you an apostle? Or are you calling yourself an apostle? Now, if a man calls himself an apostle, strike one, he's done. How, how can you be an apostle? The Lord had to personally call you. Now, how did Paul become an apostle? The Lord, the Lord him. called him. Y'all flip over he's to... face to face with him. Absolutely, face to face. Y'all go over to... Uh, let's just read it in Acts uh, 26. We'll go read Paul's account of it because it's a oh, good... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good stuff, okay. Alright, Acts 26. Now Paul has told here, talking to uh, King Agrippa, and he's told him what kind of a person he was. An uh, ultra-religious Pharisee, holier than thou, and I mean, he just, he was a he was the most racist type of Jew you could have possibly been. He didn't even like other Jews. Only his, his own little select group. But he says at verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. You know, people would argue about Paul and they would say, now wait a minute, he just saw a light. Well, if that's what you want to believe, that's fine. But what did he say right here? I will appear unto thee. Yeah, this, what Paul saw on the road to Damascus was the beginning. It wasn't the end. Wow. Now he says next, Deliver me from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. He's going to send the most racist Jew in the world to the Gentiles? Yeah, and be scared of You talk about a shock. Shock for both parties, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? Now he says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which were sanctified by faith that is in me. And he goes on to say, he did it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He went out and he preached it. So, then Paul saw the Lord. He was commissioned of the Lord. He's told him right there, this is what the Lord's got for you to do. <clears throat> now, the Lord appeared unto Paul, 
not only to save him, but to appoint him an apostle, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And not just an apostle, an apostle with a unique ministry. You know, go out into the Gentile world. Okay, so next, we see that an apostle also had to be taught by the Lord, didn't he? Well, let's go look at a few things Paul had to say. In Galatians chapter 1, you know, when y'all get home tonight, y'all read Galatians chapter 1 and 2. Because what Paul's doing in the entire thing, 1 and 2, is proving he's an apostle and proving how he got his message. <clears throat> now, in Galatians 1.11, Paul is talking to these people and he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Did he get it from other men? No. Don't y'all, I mean, y'all read the account. From the time Paul left heading to Damascus, nobody appeared to him until the Lord. Did anybody preach the gospel? Uh -uh. He heard the gospel preached by Stephen, and what did he say? Stone him. Yeah, yeah. So he said it wasn't of man. Now watch verse 12. For I neither received it, the gospel, of man, neither was I taught it, in other words, by man. So just like he said he wasn't made an apostle of men or by men, he said I also wasn't taught the gospel of men or by men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So where did Paul get his teaching? From the revelation. Direct from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he spends two entire chapters in the Galatian epistle proving this because, look, if it wasn't so, he wasn't an apostle. So he proves that the Lord taught him. And in the Galatian epistle, he goes into a lot of detail. He says, look, as soon as it happened, I didn't run to Jerusalem to get somebody to teach me. Matter of fact, they shuffled me out of town and three years later I went to Jerusalem. I never had a chance. He said, yet when I went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter, did I ask Peter, would you please teach me this message? Mm -hmm. He went down there and told Peter, this is what I'm preaching. How does it match what you're preaching? Yeah. And you know, he went down there as Peter's equal, not as a student, as Peter's equal. Right. So he spends two chapters in Galatians proving this. And when Paul goes down there again, he said in 2 Corinthians that he was not the least wit behind the chiefest apostle. Now, who in the twelve's eyes would have been the chiefest apostle? Peter. Peter. Well, in the Galatian letter, what does he prove? He said, I went and seen Peter. I communicated the gospel I was preaching unto him, and they agreed, they shook hands, and they said, look, we're going to continue with the Jews. God picked you to go to the Gentiles. Bless your ministry and go, brother. And he said, matter of fact, I had Titus with me, and nobody asked Titus to get circumcised. Why are you now asking us to, to circumcise Gentiles? He said, that didn't happen. He said, matter of fact, to show you that I was not the least wit behind Peter in my message, a little while after that, I had to rebuke Peter. Remember when he says that? Uh -huh. He said, Peter come to Antioch, and he, he was doing something out of line, and I, Paul, rebuked Peter, and what did Peter say? Amen, Paul. Mm -hmm. So, you see, he's proving his apostleship. Okay? All right, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's go to another way to look at it. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Another way to prove that Paul was taught of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Paul's speaking about the gospel here. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. In other words, unless you're just professing to believe this, and you don't really believe it, which had to be the case with some of them, because they didn't believe in resurrection, did they? No. Nope. But he says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all, who was the first one to go to Corinth? Paul. Uh -oh. Now these other people had come behind him, hadn't they? Mm -hmm. And what are they saying? He ain't an apostle. And Paul says, wait a minute. Who's the first one that came there and preached to you? They said, well, you were. And who worked signs and miracles on one? Well, you did. Did you receive the Spirit? Yes. Did you get saved? Yes. Then how can I not be an apostle? That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. But these people that had come behind him claiming to be apostles are saying he's not an apostle. And Paul's saying, well, if I'm not an apostle, you ain't saved. I mean, that's what it comes down yeah. to. It. So he says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Paul says here that he received this. So did men teach it to him? No. Now go over to 1 Corinthians 11. Because he says something very interesting in 1 Corinthians 11. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. And he's telling them you know, how, they, how to do the Lord's Supper. What they were doing was making a mockery of it. But in verse 23 he tells them, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. Now what did he receive from the Lord? The details of the Lord's Supper. Watch what he says. That the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks. That's what we read in Matthew, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So when the Lord was teaching Paul, what did the Lord do? He went over the details of what happened, didn't he? And where did Paul get this from? From Peter and them? No, from the Lord himself. Okay. Now he does it again in 1 Thessalonians 4. And I know, look, we're bouncing all over the place, but I told y'all when we started this Roman epistle, oh, it's, good stuff. it's going to make us study the whole Bible. Isn't it? And that's what we ought to do. We need to compare the, what we're seeing here with all the light of Scripture. Alright, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul starts talking about the resurrection of the, of the dead and talking about our hope, the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, where would Paul possibly get this information? From the Lord. From the Lord. He either got it from a man or from the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Now watch what he says about it. He says, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Where did Paul get this from? The, Lord. the words of the Lord. Okay, the Lord taught it to him. Now, with these kind of points proven, Paul's words would be received by the Romans as the words of Christ Himself. Because mm -hmm. what an apostle was, an apostle was a, was a person with an office sent out from the Lord to bear witness of what the Lord told him to bear witness of. Like an ambassador. Like an ambassador. Now, when an ambassador comes and that ambassador is honest and he's true to his task, when the ambassador speaks, who's speaking? The, the Lord. The one that sent him. That's right. the, his Lord, his master, his king, yep. his president, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Paul said in a, uh, another place, talking about the, uh, the Galatians, he said, when I came there, you received me as an angel of the Lord. He said, more than an angel, you received me as Christ himself. And they should have, shouldn't they? Yep. Not that Paul was Christ, but they received him as a direct messenger from Christ. A representative. Okay, a representative. All right, let's go see what Peter says about Paul. Go to 2 Peter 3. Now, if Paul can prove he's an apostle to the Romans and establishes that, then what would the Romans then do? If Paul establishes these facts, then a true Roman believer, what would the Roman believer then say in his mind, if he believed, verse 1. The Roman believer, if he believed, verse 1, that Paul was a servant, an apostle appointed by Christ, and separated under the gospel, the Roman believer would then say, well, then this letter is legitimate. Is legitimate. In fact, he would say, this letter is Scripture. Yep. Yeah. In other words, he'd say, hey, I ain't just fixing to read a, a letter from a friend. Yeah. I'm fixing to receive the Word of God. Now, did Peter and Paul agree on this? Well, watch what Peter says in 2 Peter 3.15. He says, account that the long-suffering, talking about the Lord's waiting, not returning immediately, the mm -hmm. long-suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul. You know, Paul said that the long-suffering of the Lord leadeth to salvation, leadeth people to repentance. Mm -hmm. He says here, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, did he say that included him? No. Those that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So what did Peter consider Paul's writings? Scriptures. The Word of God. 
So Peter accepted Paul as an apostle, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there we've got it established. Now, uh, there's something else we need to talk about. The false doctrine of apostolic succession. Are y'all familiar with that? Uh -uh. The Roman Catholic Church, it, it bases everything that they teach on this principle. What they say is that they have an unbroken lineage of, of leaders going all the way back to Peter. In other words, they say, the Lord Jesus Christ gave authority to the twelve. And the twelve had special power and authority, didn't they? When the twelve spoke, who was it like was speaking? The Lord. Like the Lord was speaking. Well, what do they say in 2020 about the Pope? The same thing. The same thing. So to prove their, their theory, what do they say? Well, this Pope got it from the last Pope. Yeah. And he got it from before him, and blah, 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 Like a bloodline. Like a bloodline. And where do they say it all goes back to? The first Pope, Peter, they said. See, that's what's known as apostolic succession. In other words, what they're teaching is that the apostles were a special office, and that that office has never passed away, but it's been entrusted to the Roman church, and that they've still got an apostle sitting on the throne over there. Now, is that what the Pope thinks he is? No, no. More than an apostle. In fact, Pope, he's, he'll tell you he is Christ's representative on earth. Well, folks, that's what every Christian's supposed to be. That man has no authority. No. You know what I would say to that man? Oh, you're an apostle. You're a successor. You're of the lineage of Peter. Okay. Raise the dead. That's it. Did the Lord personally teach you? They, they all say, yeah, the Lord told me. The Lord told me. But we've got a very easy test. See, we really don't even have to ask this man to perform miracles. And they do lying wonders and whatnot. We've got something e even more authoritative than the voice of an apostle. We've got to read it so all I got to do to test the Pope is say, okay, tell me how to be saved. It yeah. is, if they ain't omitted. Yeah, well, true. But he says, well, to be saved, you got to perform these seven sacraments. Would you show me those in the Bible? Show me those. Show me those seven sacraments in here. Well, they're not in there. They're in our church traditions. Well, then you're no apostle. This is the authority. Isn't it? Right. Hey, so then this, this thing about apostolic succession. Now, it's proven false by the marks of an apostle. Again, it's not just Rome that teaches this. Look, many of the Episcopal churches and churches of England teach it about their bishops that they've got a succession. And folks, this is nothing new. He, I'll give you an example of what, what for instance, uh, he, Wayne will remember that I had a man tell me that he was going to keep me from ever being able to preach the gospel to anybody because he wasn't going to lay hands on me. You remember that, Wayne? And by not laying hands, by him not ordaining me, I'd never be able to preach. See, what we were taught was the same thing about baptism. That baptism had a lineage. And if you weren't baptized with our baptism, if you were baptized in another church, that's no good. You've got to be baptized by this. And well, how can he baptize? Because he was baptized by an authorized baptizer. Or where did he get his authority from? A, and where did it go back to? It goes all the way back. It goes all the way back. Folks, there ain't a lick of truth in any of that. How in the world, I mean, y'all look at Paul. Did anybody ever once come along to Paul and say, hold on, Paul, now you're going to be, you're going to take up the baton and run with this thing? No. The Lord picked him, didn't he? Yep. And when Paul's job was done, what happened to Paul? He died. Okay? He died. Did he ever once mention naming a successor as a possible? No. Nope. No. Now, if ever he was going to name one, Timothy would have been one, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. But I want to show you all this thing about this. This is, you know, uh, first off, y'all go look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 again. And we should have read it before, but I want to read verse 8 because it's very important. He's talking about all the people that the Lord appeared to. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And in talking about all the people that the Lord appeared to, notice what Paul says. He says, verse 8, last of all. Now, what does that mean? The end. The end. Last of all, he was seen of me. Now, who's the last one that saw the risen Lord in his flesh body? Oh. Dr. Paul. Has anybody seen him since? Uh -uh. And how are you going to have another apostle? You can't have it. It's impossible. According to Scripture, it's impossible. Well, folks, we don't need another apostle. No. The apostles served a purpose, and yet that purpose has been fulfilled. 
Now, he, he goes on and says some of these things, but we don't have any need for the apostles today once the New Testament was compiled. Now, before we had the written authority, where did Jesus Christ place the spoken authority? In the apostles. And so the apostles went out and they spoke with the authority of Christ, didn't they? Mm -hmm. But they also wrote with the authority of Christ. And once we've got it written down, guess what? We don't need that spoken authority any longer. We've got it written down. Now I want you all to go to Ephesians 2. This to me is wonderful. Ephesians 2.19 You know, the, the doctrines of the Bible never pass out of time. There's no such thing as being out of date. They're always just as fit for today as they ever were for any time. How many people do we have running around today claiming inspiration? How many claiming to be prophets or apostles? Lots of them, don't we? Well, here we've got it right here. Now watch what he says. And he's talking about the fact that the Ephesian believers, Gentiles, are exactly the same as the Jewish believers. That there's no difference. They're all in one body, right? Mm -hmm. If we had a Jewish man come in here today and he believed any different between the rest of us, they didn't lick a difference mm -hmm. between any of us. He looked, there's Lexi, female, here I am, male. In the body of Christ, any difference? No. No, no difference. Believers, right? We are pure. We are. And here you got it. Now, verse 19, he says, now therefore ye, believers, Gentile believers, are no more strangers and foreigners as they had been, but fellow citizens with the saints. Now if you are a fellow citizen, all right, I'm going to give you an example. Tanner there claimed, he told us just a little while ago, it won't be long and he will be a fellow citizen with us of Alabama. Mm -hmm. and then what will he be known as? An Alabama. Well, if you had been cut off from the commonwealth of Israel and you're now made a fellow citizen of the commonwealth of Israel, then what are you now considered? You're considered that spiritual Israelite, aren't you? So he says, <clears throat> um, you're no, no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built, past tense now, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Mm -hmm. Now, y'all consider a foundation. Do you go on building a foundation? No. What do you do with a foundation? Folks, you lay a foundation and build on, on it. Top of it. On top of it. So, who is the, the chief cornerstone? The Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Any need for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in His flesh and perform His work again? No. He performed it. It's done. What came next? The apostles and prophets. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. He says to the Ephesians, You are built upon. What does upon mean? Up on. So the ones He's talking to in the analogy of a house... Are they down here? Or are they upon all of this? They're upon it. Well, as soon as you place one upon this, what does that prove about this? The foundation's finished. Folks, you do not go on building the foundation. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We don't need another foundation up here in the roof. We've got the foundation. It's laid. So that's what the apostles and prophets represented. The foundation. <clears throat> All right. Paul never once made mention of mentoring anybody for an apostle, did he? Remember, we're talking about this apostolic succession, right? But I want you all to notice what he does do. Go to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, 1. I want you all to notice how careful Paul is in his choice of words. Well, of course he is. Is his words going to be perfect if he's inspired by the Spirit? Yep. All right. Ooh. In 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, watch exactly how this man says this. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. He didn't say Paul and Sosthenes, a couple apostles, did he? Mm -hmm. He didn't say Sosthenes, a called apostle. 
He didn't say, Paul, a called apostle, and Sosthenes, my protege in training. He didn't say any of that, did he? See, the reason is, Sosthenes was a brother. Now, up here, aren't all servants brothers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of the brethren. They're part of the brethren. I'll put brothers and sisters, however you want to call it, right? No. Nope. But all of us fit the bill of servants. Sure. Was Sosthenes a servant? Yes. But he wasn't an apostle, was no. he? Notice how careful Paul is to say that? Yep. You know, that ain't even proper etiquette. No, proper right. etiquette is, is, I would say, well, Chris and I. Mm -hmm. Paul said, no. Paul and Apostle. He puts the first thing first, doesn't yep. he? It's not a fit of ego either. He's, up, he's understanding his position and his authority. Okay? Let's go look at another one. Go to uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1. Philippians 1.1 1, 1. He says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. Now when Paul refers to himself as a servant, he's okay to call, call Timothy that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Paul and Timothy, servants. But could he call Timothy an apostle? Mm -hmm. Now you know, there is a way in which the word apostle is used when it just means one cent. And we've got that in Scripture several times, and Timothy is once referred to as it, but he does not hold the office of an apostle. Now look, if, if ever there was any truth to apostolic succession, Paul was on his deathbed. He was, knew he was about to get, according to history, get his head cut off. They say, I think April 29th is, is the day they say it happened. I, but anyway, he's going to get his head cut off, and he writes to Timothy, doesn't he? Does he say anything in 2 Timothy about, now you're going to have to take the office over as apostle? Mm -mm. Does he make any mention of an election or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Why? Because he had run his course. When Paul says, I have run my course, it meant as an apostle, this apostle has run his course and he's no longer needed. That's right. Now, if ever he was going to name someone to succeed him as apostle, who would it have been? It would have been Timothy. Go over to chapter 2 while we're here and watch what he says. In Philippians 2, verse 19, he tells the Philippians, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Did Paul have anybody like-minded as Timothy? No. Did he ever make mention of training Timothy to be an apostle? No. As best he could call Timothy was a servant and a brother. Yep. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go uh, look at one more example, if y'all don't mind. Go over to uh, Colossians. Let's see, did we do that one yet? No, Colossians 1. Colossians 1? Yep, yeah, Colossians 1. Again, In Colossians 1.1 1, 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother. You notice how careful he is? Mm -hmm. You know, I know this seems like a small thing, but it's not. Let's pay attention to these introductions because we'll learn a lot about the person writing, won't we? Did Paul understand the uniqueness of his office? Yeah. He did. Yeah, he did. And he knew quite well that his office did not fit these other men even though they were co-workers with him, weren't they? Mm. They were not apostles. Now, Timothy could never make the claim to be an apostle. Even if Timothy had the ability to work miracles, because we read where men had signs and whatnot. It was Timothy, did he hear the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ? No. He heard it from Paul. Yeah. Did, did Timothy learn what he learned from the Lord Jesus Christ? No. He learned it from Paul. Now, there's a, a great way to look at this. Well, we'll hold off on that. Next, let's talk about this. We, we dealt with apostolic succession. Okay? I'll put it up here. Apostolic succession. Is there any truth to any such doctrine? No. Nope. Folks, there's no truth to that office being passed on. That man sitting over there in that pointed hat ain't no more Christ representative on this earth than, than uh, a man in a satanic uh, temple is. 
And basically the man in the satanic temple is doing less harm than the man in Rome. Because at least you know when you go into a satanic temple, you go going to see Satan. Yeah, you, know you? Know what to you know what to expect. So apostolic succession. But while we're talking about this thing with apostles, we better go ahead and deal with this faith healing. That's a big ministry today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The faith healing ministry. Okay? Now, everybody that's involved in these faith healing ministries, they all make the claim that they alone are operating properly under the commission that the Lord gave. Because they alone are claiming these powers, right? Mm -hmm. So what they basically say, they say, look, we discovered the power and we're, we're laying hold on power that hasn't been used for 1,800 years. We're literally, we're modern day apostles here. We're laying hold of this thing. Y'all have all missed the boat. That's kind of the thing they said, mm -hmm. right? Now, they all use the same two verses. They don't use Matthew 28. Go unto all the world, teach baptized. They don't go teaching. that. None of that's used. They use Matthew 10. Go over to Matthew 10. This is their favorite verse. In Matthew 10, this is where they get their authority, they say. Matthew 10, 8. I tell you, we'll read 7 too. He says, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Now they say if you don't claim those things that you're not really believing. Now they're not saying everybody that doesn't do these things is going to hell. They don't, they don't want to offend anyone. What they do say is that they are chosen of God as special ministers because they lay hold on this power. Now any truth to it? No. First thing I note again in that is uh, heal the sick. You see a lot of that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. don't you? I don't see any cleansing of lepers. Mm -hmm. I certainly hadn't seen any raise the dead. Now these men lay hold on these claims, don't they? Yep. I have not yet one, not met one or heard one of them yet that goes on. Because look at the next verse. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Every one of them that's on the TV doing the faith healing, what do they all want you to do? Send you money. Send you money. See, they don't even... You see what I mean? Yeah, I see exactly yeah, it's ridiculous, mean. isn't it? So, number one, they're, 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 you say, what well, there it is in the verse. The verse says to do that. But I want you all to notice something. Go back. Verse 10. Or 10 verse 1. When He had called unto Him His twelve disciples, He gave them power against unclean spirits. There was a whole multitude with him, but he picked twelve and gave them a special office, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He gave them this power, and he sent them out. And in verse 5 it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. At that time, did he give those twelve men a special commission? Mm -hmm. How could a faith healer today claim that and go to Gentiles? You see, it's, it's just it's completely false, okay? He sent those men out at that time. And at that time, he said, don't go to the Gentiles. He did not say, you will never go to Gentiles. That's what people teach, but he didn't say that. Because right after the cross, what did he tell them? Go to the, go to the Gentiles. But at that time, he said, go out and I'm going to give you this power and they went out and they exercised that power didn't mm -hmm. did he ever tell anyone else those things yeah. no folks they don't have that commission so this faith healing thing falls on its face now go over to uh, mark 16 this is another one they like to claim Alright, in Mark 16, he says this. Verse 15. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now this is after the cross, and this is a different commission, because now he's saying, Go to all the Gentiles in. Mm -hmm. So this is different. But he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And that's, in my opinion, that's not water baptized. When you believe, are you baptized by the Spirit into the body? Yes, sir. If you want to say that's water baptism and say everybody that believes will get baptized, that, that's your business. But verse 17, he says, 
these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, he didn't say, these signs shall follow when a person believes these signs will follow. He says, these, these signs will follow them that believe. He's sending these believers out, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Here's the signs. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing... By the way, who is the only one in the Bible that took up a serpent and didn't hurt him? Moses. No. Well, Moses, yeah, in Old Testament. How about Paul? Yeah, Paul, he did when he was on that island. On that island, he did. Paul fits the apostle. But he says next, uh, If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, we see people claim some of those things, don't we? Mm -hmm. But you don't see them drinking poison, do you? Mm -hmm. Well, why, would this, why did the Lord say to do this? These signs, He called them. He didn't say these powers. He said these signs. What are because signs? the Jews had to have a sign. They had to have a sign at the time. Why did they need a sign to verify the ministry? It wasn't written down. Folks, they did not have the New Testament compiled. These men are going out, and they're going out as eyewitnesses. Now, what does an eyewitness have to go on? Is His word. Yeah. That's it. But once an eyewitness testifies and it's entered into the court documents, what do you have to go on? The you court. go down there and pull the court yeah. documents, can't you? Mm -hmm. All right, so then the difference is the eyewitness has to be verified. So God verified them. Watch how it says it in Hebrews 2. I thank God that this passage is in the Bible because this really puts an end to it. For me, it, it does. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews is talking here. And he tells these people, he's talking about the not believing the gospel and the danger of it. But in verse 3 he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first... Now when he says at the first, what's he doing? He's going back to the foundation, isn't he? Mm -hmm. In other words, if I put the timeline up here like this, this man is writing over here, about 60, and he says, hey, at the first, at the first, at the beginning of all of this, he says, verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Okay, when did this message of salvation begin? The Lord began to speak it, didn't He? Here we'll put the Lord right here. The Lord Himself in His flesh testified to these things, didn't He? Mm -hmm. How did He verify the message was from God? Signs. Folks, He had the power of God. He worked the signs, didn't He? Mm -hmm. Now it says next, uh, it was first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. So this person is saying, everything that the Lord said was confirmed unto us by Him. By them, right? So the Lord spoke, and who did He speak to? I'll just put the twelve. And the twelve went out and they spoke, didn't they? And He said, third party. Everything that they said was confirmed unto us. Did he say we are going out and confirming this message? No, no. He said for the writer, he said they confirm these things to us. Now watch what it says next. God also bearing them witness. Does he say God still bearing us witness? No. God bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. You see what this man's saying? He's saying, look, God Himself testified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke and God testified in the miracles, didn't He? Mm -hmm. He sends these 12 eyewitnesses out with no, no uh, testimony written down yet and what does He do? He continues to do the same thing. God Himself testified through these men. He said God bore them witness with signs and wonders. He never said there God is still bearing us, did He? Uh -huh. He never said God will bear you. He said this is how it happened at the first. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm doing my best to follow my notes. Uh, okay, one more thing to say about this. 
we've got church history that will also help us in this, in this matter. For instance, have there been some incredible revivals of the preaching of the gospel? Yeah, there have been some incredible revivals in church history. Look at some of these great revivals and the men that God used, right? Luther. Nobody would doubt Martin Luther did something incredible, didn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, John Calvin. Knox. Uh, Whit Tyndale. Whit Wycliffe. Uh, Wycliffe. Uh, but how about Whitfield? George Whitfield preached to half America. He preached to all of England and Scotland and most of Ireland. Folks, thousands upon thousands of people got saved. Real conversions got saved, right? Did God use that man mightily in the preaching of the Gospel? Did He ever once perform a sign, a miracle, or a wonder? There's no, he never even made such a claim, did He? Well, then if that was something that was necessary, why wasn't it there? How about Wesley? At the same time, Wesley was doing the same thing, wasn't he? Did he ever have it happen? How about Jonathan Edwards in America? The Great Awakening, they called it, up in New England. Folks, thousands of people got saved. I mean, God's Spirit went to work and He fanned the flames and people started getting saved everywhere. And I don't mean religious hysteria. I mean real conversions. Did Jonathan Edwards ever once perform a sign, wonder, or miracle? No. You just don't see it. You see, it's proof of something. God honored those men and their ministry with conversions, didn't He? But He never honored them with, by confirming anything with signs and wonders. When George Whitfield went out and preached the gospel, what's the only confirmation he needed? He had that book in his hand, didn't he? Mm -hmm. It's all he needed, right? You know, it's more amazing today when people get saved to me than it is in the apostolic times. You see somebody raise the dead and that you get a, a pagan on that island. They saw Paul get bit by that snake that was must have been a horrible snake and didn't die and they all said, Whoa, there's something mm -hmm. wrong here, something different, right? But what if you just went on there with a book? Uh-uh. They wouldn't have been interested. You'd yet. say they couldn't be interested. But what have men done for 2,000 years? They've gone into the pagan world with a book. Yep. And what's happened? People have been converted. Folks, that's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So again, this thing about the faith healing, it's a bunch of baloney, folks. Okay? It just don't buy into it. Don't believe it. It's foolishness. Now, one, we're going to stop there because this is a good stopping point. And next time we pick up, we'll pick up with this separated of God to the Gospel. We'll pick up with this point. Because Paul is escalating his case, right? But when he says that he's separated to the Gospel, it's my opinion, y'all study it this week, it's my opinion that he's making a play on words. I don't think he's just saying, look, I'm an apostle that preaches the Gospel and I've been separated to preach the Gospel. He's not just repeating himself. What was a Pharisee? Y'all know what the word Pharisee means? Separate. To separate. It means divide from. Paul said, essentially what Paul's saying is, in my opinion, he's making a play on words. He said, look, there was a time in my life when I separated myself and self-righteousness from everything and I really thought I was something. But when the time came, God separated me. And He said, that's my authority. I was chosen of God. And God not only chose me to preach this message, but God chose me to write this letter to you Romans and this is Scripture. And that's what they were going to need to believe to receive this letter, weren't they? It's what we've got to believe today. That's right. Okay, any questions about that? No? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You for this wonderful epistle. We thank You for the ministry of this man, Paul, that You sent out among people like us. And Lord, we thank You. We thank You that You've given us Your Word and it's all the verification we need. It's Your truth. Your words never fail. They're pure. They're tried in a furnace. Every word of yours comes to pass. And Lord, we know you're often long-suffering and it might seem like you're tearing. Let us not fret. Let us not get nervous. Let us look at that as an opportunity to preach the gospel to more people in the lost world. Let us be always busy about your business. Take this word. Take these things from your book and build us up and strengthen us. Make us strong in the inner man that Christ might dwell in our hearts more fully and more purposefully. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen.